For Blue Star Contemporary, this is the Artist Digest, and I'm Jacqueline Saragosa McGilvery, speaking with artists about their inspirations and practice. Today I'm speaking with Sarah Welch about her exhibition Giveth and Taketh. Sarah Welch is an artist, illustrator, and comics maker based in Houston, Texas. She is a regular collaborator with Letterpress and Resograph print service Mystic Multiples and a co-organizer with ZineFest Houston. Welch has participated in exhibitions nationally and artist residencies and education programs, including Skowhagen School of Painting and Sculpture, the McDowell Colony, Wesleyan University, and Lawndale Art Center. Sarah, let's start with talking about the Holdouts comics, which you made around the time you experienced Hurricane Harvey. Did the experience of Harvey influence or change your works, or did you see an impact on how viewers engaged with them? So, book one, uh, the first chapter of this uh, Holdouts comic thing, uh, we made like the whole thing and self-published it like in May 2017, and Harvey was August 2017, and um, yeah, so it was definitely like a before and after from book one to two. Um, I don't think it's influenced the way people view the work necessarily because I think many people they don't you know they don't know about like my personal experience with the flooding and like it's sort of the narrative is sort of thinly veiled. Houston, it doesn't name Houston specifically anyway in the books. Um, but for me, uh, it was, writing the follow-up was a little bit different because I think, um, I don't know, I think it was like, there's like more like an emotional perspective, like for sure having like experienced like the first hand of it, it wasn't just like coming up with the, um, some kind of like reasonably believable future world it was sort of like oh like how am I as like an individual person like taking this experience and dealing with it Mm -hmm. and that's definitely reflected in like the protagonist from book two Mm -hmm. so there's more more real experience I guess to to influence the the work yeah I think it's um there's a little less like um literal stuff like literal activity in the story going on in book two i think there's a lot more um of a kind of like psychological narrative taking place Hmm. yeah so that book those those books are kind of the the core of the exhibition at blue star titled giveth and taketh um can you talk about where the title for the exhibition comes from yeah, um, so the title is also, it's also the subtitle from book two, Hold Out, Skip It, and Take It. And it's, um, it's kind of calling on a couple of things. It's like, you know, it's calling on like the biblical reference mm-hmm. <laughs> and like the idea of like this kind of like flooding and extreme change feeling sort of like apocalyptic, but it's also trying to speak to the, um, give and take relationship humans have with the um the environment and the earth at large and that maybe kind of connects to where you're coming from with um referencing uh victorian morning rituals like the idea of give and take or our impact and relationship um where did those the influences uh, in the installation that are referencing uh victorian morning rituals come from or can you talk about those elements of the installation yeah so part of the the psychological narrative that's taking place in book two is about the protagonist basically going through a morning grieving process um dealing with um uh just like the loss of place the loss of life the loss of like previous like known experience and um uh so it's sort of applying um those victorian ideas which were um it's funny like i think in retrospect a lot of people see that victorian morning culture is very like indulgent um and uh, in a way, it uh, might not like make immediate 
makes sense with this with a situation in which you're like being forced to like act on your feet all the time and just like move forward and like be resilient and like all that stuff people want out of like uh humans dealing with crises um but for me i kind of wanted to like slow down the story and like reflect back through the character um so that's where some of the stuff in the installation that ceramic piece is like referencing like victorian morning jewelry but it's sort of an object that's meant to channel the protagonist in this book and it's supposed to be an object that could be ostensibly like made by that character like if they were making a victorian morning object what would that look like um so it has um a lot of the uh, pendants on it are like different reptiles and amphibians and plants and like animals that are like not long for this world <laughs> and um the uh mural that's like on the far wall in the back of the installation room is sort of an abstraction of a morning reef um it's like a very sparse mm-hmm. sparse reef shape um that has a um an endangered plant that's that's referenced in the in the narrative in the comic um and that plant is making up like the reef shape and uh yeah i think the reef the reef shape and the idea of uh reefs and like non-linear um you mm-hmm. know, cyclical time is really important because this comic and like the installation at large are kind of giving um different perspectives like the individual human perspective versus like there's perspective of the earth and like that different timeline that's much longer than individual people's lives yeah yeah Yeah. well and i and yeah and thinking about mourning you're obviously you're obviously going to be thinking about your life at beyond your physical body and so there's also like a new kind of pool of the possibility of time maybe um, when you're thinking about you know spiritual space like that and and even kind of trying to connect your body to to the earth in, or you know your to your to the impact on the earth then it expands beyond your your lifetime um, with the the relationship between your installations and your comics um, and your publications those really the you know the publications and the illustrations and all of that are a dominant part of your practice and the the um installations are kind of a chance to expand that space it seems like um can you talk about how how publications and comics became so uh central to what you do as an artist um so actually i was doing for some time I was doing installation and like interdisciplinary stuff before comics um, and started like fell in love and got wrapped up in comics in 2009, 2010, somewhere in there, which seems like a long time ago now, but but basically um, when I was doing the comics, when you're doing the world building and inventing like the look of the place, like... um, imagining like rooms like you know where a character might live or clothing that you might wear or like objects they might uh run into um in doing that and doing the world building um I got really excited about like inventing like objects and like um spaces and so the installations just felt like a natural extension of what I was already doing to make the books in the first place um, so I just like I had to see them together <laughs> and specifically the installations are usually the format of a reading room so can you kind of maybe talk about how that how reading rooms function um, for book based work or as a specific type of uh, installation right so with the reading rooms um, the way they're the objects that are in them and the design of them are sort of like all being built simultaneously like in my mind while I'm also working on the comics um I'm like 
doing sketches and thinking about like um, a room in which these books would live um, and drawing out things from the comics that like I feel like need to be seen in some three dimensional way. Um, so for those reading rooms, uh, the copies of the comics will, exhibition copies will be in the room, they stay in the room, but people can take them down and read them, put them back, and they get to, like, read the full story, experience the space, like, see the objects in there, and connect them back to the story that they've just read, and I like that kind of full interaction. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think that it also gives them the space to to slow down, and, and I think it also encourages multiple viewings of the exhibition, which I which I always enjoy. Or like, I like when you come into a space and you know, like, oh, I have to come back. There's so much. There's so much here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's funny. Like the books themselves are pretty short, but the work that goes into like making the books and like doing the space is could can be like years long. <laughs> so, yeah, there's yeah. definitely a lot to see. Um the and also building your world both in the exhibition space and in the book format. Um the color green is is dominant. It's a signature color. Um can you talk about um, how that became such a, a strong element for you? Um, so the Risograph, uh, my partner James Beard uses to print all of our books. Um, it's an old duplicator and uh, it has um, set colors that were produced for the machine. And we do pretty simple color combos, usually no more than three, um, but green and black were some of the first standardized uh, colors we had for the machine so just you know out of necessity we were using those a lot in the beginning um and then I actually um I hated this green when we started I thought it was a really horrible (laughs) shade of green but now I love it and um uh it just became like entrenched in the work and it felt right because so many of the works I produce are Gulf Coast specific And, like, the green and black is just, like, that, you know, duality between being in this, like, luscious subtropical environment on the Gulf, but also this being, like, a really, like, cement, like, (laughs) like, covered, concrete, industrial, like, petrochemical plant, like, place. So that kind of, like, grayscale, like, fighting against the green all the time, like, it made sense to me. Yeah. and it just, yeah, it bled into all the other art as well. Yeah, I think that the illustrations or the paintings that you did that were, um, like, warning posters or, like, the the kind of, like, radioactive posters, like, that also, like, what were one of the first things that I saw that also really achieved that duality of using that color, like, referencing the landscape, but also really connecting to this idea of, like, radioactivity or or chemical or like human fabricated things being like this, these bright, you know, colors like green or bright yellow or something. Yeah, that's something I I love about green is um, it's, uh, it's one of these colors that is like both completely natural, but, but on certain objects is like in certain mediums was completely unnatural and like wrong. So it's got like, got a vibration yeah 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 um my last question for you is um if you could share um the importance of beyond i guess beyond like your physical work you make the importance of books to your life or to your practice as as an artist uh right so i i love doing the comics myself i also um one of the things I studied when I was an uh, art student was um, printmaking and multiples. And like, I, I love them not only for like the, the comic form, but because I like being able to produce something that like anybody can have. Like when we go, we make tons of copies. We don't, like we do open editions. So when we print like 200 of these and we run out and people 
still want them we just pray more like and I think it's really valuable to me to be able to make something that like you know my friends and family can like have you know just as easily as like some collector who would be willing to spend more money on art but like it costs ten dollars for both of them yeah so I think that kind of like democratic element um is a big deal for me great well thank you Sarah (laughs) of course thank you This has been the Artist Digest from Blue Star Contemporary.